Hi guys, this is Cindy and Michael from Part Time Permies, and it looks like we have a whole number of people in the room already. Incense Shop and Haywire Homestead, hello. See Curie at Built, Built on the Rock Homestead. We had a video shared on our Facebook page this week. I don't know if you caught that one, no, but it was on it. the yucca plant. Um, oh, you mentioned it, but you yeah. haven't seen it. And let's see, farming our backyard. Um, and Garrett Schleich Horses. Okay, if I said that right, I think I did. Um, Green Raven and Linda Taylor. Did I say Linda Taylor right? Anyway. Nope. Okay, so a good number of people in the room already. Um, make sure we can hear us because the sound is on and I think we're okay. And I probably should adjust my screen so I can manipulate my pictures at the same time. So uh, give me a moment there, but we've been really crazy busy today. Yeah, we've been outside almost the whole day. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I didn't have my phone on me all day. I did. I wonder how many steps I did. I only had it on like two thirds of the day. I had to plug it in for I a mean, while. I was well. We were. I was finishing the last of the broad forking, the last twenty percent or so of the garden, which we're running a good two weeks late on that, and then. I was, we were moving chickens and then I was cleaning the heavy um, branches and down and stuff that fell in the snow and ice storms in the winter on our back trails yeah. and on our neighbor's trail. So all of those and things, I didn't need a phone and oh. could easily fall out with chainsaws and broad forks and such. Yeah. And oh my gosh, did you just read what Curie wrote? Don't know if I'm going to make it to the end of the show. Super tired. Dog woke me up after midnight freaking out, knew there was a predator out there, turned out to be a rattlesnake by the stairs. Oh, yeah. Dogs are good for that. Oh, my gosh. I wouldn't want the dog bit by the rattlesnake, though. Yeah, but dogs are good at letting you know that sometimes. Yes, we don't really have that issue. No. Well, ours is very Our quiet. cat came in last night absolutely soaking, soaking wet. wet. <laughs> he, he, we had a big thunderstorm come through quick, and he was outside uh, shortly before we went to bed and didn't want to come in earlier. Your mom's back from Alaska. Yeah, I knew that. They got back. <laughs> well, last, in the room. Yeah. Last Monday, I guess it was. Monday night, I think. Yeah. Hi. I hope you had or a good Sunday trip. Night. Looks like it. I saw a bunch of pictures from that. That was cool. Um, and I'm just trying to see if I missed anything else. Nope. Yeah, so you were... Doing back trails. We were doing chicken, moving the chickens. They're on pasture, so we shifted their pasture. They did a one week. We moved them last week. We moved them after this show. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of stuff set up, and we were, were running probably almost two months late on getting them out. Yeah. At least a month with the rain because um, the coop wasn't rain ready, and, and the yeah. grass took off a little later. Uh, yeah. Now things are growing really good, so we moved them really fast. We gave them seven days uh, so they don't damage the grass because it's growing we want it to come back mm -hmm. uh, get it fertilized and come back so we move them so we were doing it in the dark <laughs> um well we had what did we do we had the trailer in position we had the trailer in position but we had to move the fence and we, the chickens yeah we had or no we had the fence. we had the fence set up we had everything set up we just basically. had to carry the chickens we over. had to carry the chickens over from the winter coop to the summer coop and, and we had it all the way across the yard. Yeah, of course. So um, and then today we did, we did it, it really different. early in the morning yeah. and I was waking up and I'm like, Cindy, we can't start the tractor. It's like 530 in the morning. It was just before <laughs> six. Like I can't start the tractor. Everybody knows that they have limited mufflers. And yeah. it was also the closest section we go to our neighbor's house. And so I said, um, let's, let's make sure that I said, let me go get the pilot, our Honda pilot. Yeah. Uh, and the trailer hitch on that because, uh, at least it doesn't make that much noise. We can move the trailer. Yeah. So we Claire, bought Claire, your, uh, olive oil has, I just got your address from Cindy yesterday. A couple of, I was late on that. Sorry. Yeah. I, middle of the end of the week. I said, where's the address? So it's sitting on my computer. Oh, it will Thursday. go out tomorrow morning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause that begins my busy part. So yeah. it has not gone in the mail. It will go out uh, priority mail tomorrow, Tomorrow, which means it'll be a, just two or three days out probably from yep. that to arrive midweek. Sorry. That was partially. Usually we get it out same week, but yeah. yeah, it got delayed. But, um, okay. So yeah, you got, we got the chicken shifted with the pilot instead of the tractor 
but it works. Works just, fine. It's all wheel drive, yeah. and it's well, we've been getting a ton of rain, but we're on a dry soil, so yeah. unless it's super muddy, we're 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 in good shape with yeah, that. No. We're on sand basically, so um, all the water sinks in very quickly. Um, we did that, and then this morning. We well, we did that part. Then I went out to do garden work as well, and um, you started doing more broad forking, got the rest of the bed broad fork, and I spent the entire day in the garden putting, let's see, putting tomatoes and peppers and eggplant and uh, ground cherries and some basil all in the garden. Um, didn't get the hot peppers. I got the sweets and the Trinidad peppers, but I still have to do the hot peppers. Um, so still a lot to do because the last part of the bed is pretty much three sisters for the most part. Some yeah, squash. So we, don't, and, we don't have our squash or melons or cucumbers yeah. or corn. So mind you, I know everybody has been talking or been, you know, there's been a lot of rain in the Midwest. We had rain most of last week. Yes. We got inches and inches. It had more so, rain yesterday. The state of Michigan, as of Thursday or Friday, 25% uh, of commercial corn is in, yeah. and I think 20% or 30% of soybeans is in, and they said it is the latest, it's the lowest amount of corn ever in at this time. It is the fifth lowest amount of soybeans, and they're concerned because those that do crop insurance, if they don't get their crop in soon, they can't even apply for insurance which means they're at a full loss before they even get going. So it doesn't mean things aren't going to come out and that we're going to have a nice recovery on things. And because we're not commercial growers. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's that wet. We're also at a near all time high or at an all time high for Lake Michigan. Yeah. Well, let's talk recent history. Uh, people forget that the glaciers came through and that this was actually a, uh, what a low, under ice. Yeah. Well, and it was a low ocean at, a long, long point. time ago, yeah. um, or you know, whatever. So we, um, but yeah, Lake Michigan's really high, and our specific area, the groundwater, as at a pretty much a record high. Um, there's what twenty some houses near us that are underwater and abandoned. Twenty five houses at two lakes near us. That These are, are lakes, not rivers. Yeah. I mean that um, they that are were underwater cottages and houses that were built close to the lake. And as and the lake has gone floor, up like five feet in the last couple of years. Their uh, first floor is underwater. So there's 25 abandoned houses and those two small lakes near us. Um, we have a friend who lives on one of them and she's still okay. There's but, about six or eight roads that are impassable or mostly impassable due to yeah. water. And they're basically barricaded them. And they said, we will deal with them when the water goes down. We'll figure it out. Yeah. And we'll figure out if we have to repair them. And then they're looking at plans for either raising a couple of them or if they actually have to put in. You know, they can put no co new coverts or if they're going to have to build yeah. some bridges. Um, I mean, some people think this is going to be permanent or come back. I'm not certain that's the case. But it's always we need a long, we need a good drain out yeah. um, in the area. Again, everybody's on sand. It's just the groundwater is. The is ta ground off. table's high. So, um, so Nellie, I am doing fine. We have another big ultrasound this coming week. So we're doing the and 20 week ultrasound. Yep. Yeah. And so the 20 week scan is on Thursday. So I'll be able to let you know a little more after that. But so far, so good. Uh, feeling better. Um, I'm still been taking some of the nauseousness medicine. And that's helped a little bit, but barely any. So I've been cutting back on that a little bit this weekend. And actually, I've done all right with that. Um, I'm exhausted because I spent like 10 hours outside today, something like that. And, but just normal, I would have been exhausted. My muscles would have felt that regardless of pregnancy. So, um, doing fine otherwise. So, and there was what, chickens, uh, I caught and then forgot who it was. It just oh. did 13 chickens. Yeah. We're due to do three or four at some point when we get a moment. And then we've decided we've never done Cornish cross. We trying to we've been trying to do heritage breeds and avoid yeah monster and mixed breeds commercial really. breeds yeah. Uh, but because we don't have any broody chickens this this spring, spring probably because our young roosters weren't separated out and were bothering everybody. Yeah, we missed putting eggs under and haven't had any go broody since. So we're kind of I'm down. I find a couple more chickens in the bottom of the freezer. 
<laughs> and we're about done. Yeah. So uh, we we're talking with our friends um, that live close, and they yeah. were going to get a bunch of Cornish. Of course, you can do those in you know eight to ten weeks. Mm-hmm. So they're going to get a bunch of Cornish, but they needed a few more to bump up for the next level of discounts. Yep. They need like fifteen more, and so we decided we we're going to take we're going to take thirty of them because we're behind, and of course we want to have them in the freezer before Cindy's too far along, so that we've got a bunch of them. So we're going to take thirty, but they're going to have to brood them for us because we don't have. We don't have any a brooder, artificial um, setup. So so they said they had brood them for us, and then we'll just pay them for feed and such, and then we'll get them here for the last six weeks. Haywire has is. three broody hens. Um, I wish We've we never did. had a problem with broody hens. No. Um, th- and until we always spring. had too many for any places yeah. to put them. Um, we had our silky hen went broody, false broody, I think it was her first time going broody in January, but then she went broody again a couple months she's ago. She's got two young ones. So right she now. has two young silkies because we need more silkies. Um, and then uh, we had a couple who seemed to be going broody, but then they didn't stick with it. They're not known to be broody because they're from the main flock. So um, we have, we've had them go broody in the past. We usually yeah. have about three a year. Yeah, plenty of young ones, whatever. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but yeah. we had... So we, yeah, we've been waiting, but we just decided it's better to put Cornish Cross on, uh, you know, on land and let them forage, and um, you know, we'll do them. Hurt, it'll speed it up, and they're not going to be perfect. Uh, you know, they won't be quite as nice, but they're still going to be a lot better than the alternative. So uh, we figured we'll just do that, and it'll, it'll meet our goals. Um, and so we'll give it a try. We'd like to try Freedom Rangers or move to maybe try uh, uh, some meat birds in there along with our other ones. It would be kind of, kind of fun to maybe cross a Freedom Ranger with into our flock. Maybe yeah. if we do them one year, save a rooster and change out our rooster to to bring in the larger build into yeah. the flock. Because we have mainly we do have dual purpose breeds that are all crossed, but. Um, I don't know. I'll our our friends Jamie and, and his family, which actually they're the ones that are gonna we're gonna collaborate on with the uh, getting the chickens. He did I think Freedom Rangers and um, Cornish, Cornish Cross yeah. last year and like the Cornish Cross. Um, a lot of people like them just because they're so fast and so efficient on the feed. Uh, but we've really been trying to stay away from them a little bit. And and I know I mean Justin Rhodes does them. He really likes them. They are different when you put them on pasture than when you just leave them in a barn. So. Yeah. And Tina has her two silky hens sitting on four eggs again. Um, you might want to try have separating them in a small area. Uh, I never did a video on our making our small nursery coops maybe i could just do a walk over on all the features of it at some point uh because i think we're going to have to build something for the um for the meat chickens yeah, that we're we getting to where to... i'll probably do something sell kind of similar to skeleton style so is we'll, my we'll thought that one every day yeah let them go crazy in a small area so we've been talking um, about that today a little bit too, trying to figure out exactly how to set we've them up. We've got two chickens that are jumping out occasionally. Yeah, they might be hiding eggs. We did get 11 eggs today. So right. out of 13 hens, we have not gotten 13 eggs, but one is old enough she may not be laying at all. Uh, she'll probably be called with the roosters. Oh, yeah, I heard I heard that, yeah, Living Traditions, I heard they did the comparison also. I, Yeah, and I mean, so I guess that's a good thing to look at. We're, and our choice is, of course... In food, we do a lot of things gold standards where we where we make up what do we think our perfect thing is, and then we do a bunch of tasks compared to what our perfect is. So we're not concerned so much if we have to spend a little more on feed t- or time. Uh, obviously, we want it efficient, but uh, we really want the best quality bird, um, mm-hmm. flavor wise and such. So, uh, so yeah, there's, and if you're there's no question that Cornish Cross, if you're looking for efficiency, uh, there's nothing faster and less feed. So. So, Tina, yeah, I can do a, a video at least on the features because I have two of my, what I call the nursery coops. Uh, they're kind of based a little bit off Salatin style, smaller, so it's easier to move. And what I will what I think I'll do is I'll probably, uh, I'll do a video of walking through those features and then maybe some suggestions on what I would try on the next one because we do eventually want to build more of them, but if nobody's going broody this year, we don't need more. Yeah. And we do have materials, but we 
we'll need something for the meat chicken. So we're probably going to build that one out. Well, no, no, I don't think you ever talked about it. We and we lost Miss Blue a few weeks ago too. Yeah, we did. Which was among our old. We have one of our original flock uh, who we're not sure if she's laying. We may actually call her. Yeah. And Miss, turn her into a soup. Yeah. Super Miss Blue. She was a matriarch of the flock. She took care of the flock. She kept the fighting fighting down between hens. She so I was letting her live out her life. And she um, loved to eat. She, she always came for the treat. She always came. She was the first one to come for the so treat. So I so we had these two older ones. I went out during the day a couple of weeks ago, and there was a bird up against the outside of the fence, sitting there, sort of like it was dust bathing or it was broody. And it looked a little funny, and I went over to it and I poked at it or put my foot out and it kind of puffed up and it ran away. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, well it's probably broody or whatever. I'm like, hmm, it looks like one of the older ones. But I and um, but she had been laying all winter. Yeah, and I walked away to go over to just over to our next little section, and when I came back, there was a a bird laying on its side dead. So it somewhere just between died. me turn I literally turned my back probably when it jumped up and ran over. That was it. Whether she had had a heart attack or a stroke yeah. or or whatever it was, she Old she age. literally fell there dead. Yeah. And I looked at her and she was completely dead instantly. Yeah. And I picked her up and. Care well, I think we left her there to make sure because I, I wasn't sure. I didn't think it was Miss Blue at first. I thought it was. Yeah, well, one. you put her in the barn for a little bit. So I left her in the barn for Cindy to look at. Her. Yeah. Gave her a little berry. Yeah. <laughs> Buried her because we don't. We don't know the cause of death. We're going to eat them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So she, I mean, it's probably old age, but at, in old age, immune system starts going down and so we don't want any, you know, yeah. sick. So I don't know. Chicken. It was something really but, sudden. So. But yeah, it could have very well been just a heart attack. It was just weird. I'm like, wait a minute. I know it was looking a little weird, but it got up and I ran away. Look. And all of a sudden, all the chickens, you know, they're all around it. And it's like <laughs> totally gone. So. Yeah. Oh, well. So, um, so yeah, we lost Miss Blue. She was, she came with the house. So we've been in this house since 2015, February. February. So four and a half. Four and a half years. And she so, was matured, so she was... She was mature when we bought the house. Probably so around was, six or years, or maybe more. Yeah, she may have been more. Well, the only the other know. people only here two years, right? Only a couple years. So she was probably so, five, six, between, seven years old, yeah, somewhere in there. Between five and seven. Yeah. Uh, so she she did all right. And the last Buff Orpington that we have is still going. It's just she's not lean anymore. So, And she had some potential health issues a couple months ago she wasn't that, looking real good for a few for a week or so so but she's she seems to be doing well but she's freeloading at the moment so she's probably going to go whenever we do the roosters so i want to know that was well, built on a wreck i want to know how it's carrie carrie exactly i want to know how she got the snake out of the house was it in the house or was it at the bottom the of the stairs of the front door oh that's a good point it may not yeah. have been in the house so where was that snake? That is a good question. If it wasn't in the house. It's a little easier. <laughs> um, what was your What was your method of disposal, yeah. <laughs> removal? Oh, thanks, Grammy. Yeah, we have yeah the fireplace. We don't have any fire. Yeah, in we it had now. a cold snap a few weeks ago. About a month ago, we had a fire. Yeah, we, we did. We hadn't had one for a while. Yeah. Um, we're running low on firewood. I actually have a friend who had a huge silver maple or a hardwood, a hard maple. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was, it's trunk is, it's more than that. It's yeah. four and four and a half feet wow. across. It, it is Old a one. big maple uh, that came, they took it down last fall and they've been asking me to come over. Uh, they, a lot of the wood was left by the um, tree company. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to split it. And I have a splitter and I have a big truck. Uh, and so we've been talking about, but we're all very busy going over that. I said, fine, if I can get one or two load, you know, truckloads of wood, mm -hmm. I'll come over and we'll do it. And that would be, you know, half or less. And they have a backyard fire pit. They don't even have a working fireplace. So they're like, yeah, that would be perfect. So yeah. at some point I'm hoping to replenish with now it's it will have been down a year. Yeah. It's supposed to be rock maple or silver maple, but whatever it is, it was not rotted in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, well, not in these pieces. And so it will be really nice. In fact, I should probably do some hardwood smoking barbecue with oh, some yeah. with some of it because it is good solid maple. It's probably good maple for smoking. I'm sure it's good for smoking. Absolutely. Um, barbecue. 
food that is. <laughs> um, anyway, it was stairs to the front door. Okay. Right next to the stairs. Well, that's not as dramatic as stairs Inside. In, in the house. <laughs> that would be bad. Uh, then, but then still, you have to do something about it before you can go to bed. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Hopefully, it just went away by morning, and I wouldn't want to touch a rattlesnake. I used to catch garter snakes, but that's a different, much different. We haven't heard coyotes much yet, but we've had so much rain. I mean, every day, every other yeah, day, we yeah. had rain, and they and they run at different times. But when we're getting heavy weather, I don't think they they're not real excited. No. So a lot um, of turkeys in back. <laughs> yeah, everybody's different. So living traditions in a comparison like the Cornish better, Coghill Farm like the Freedom Rangers better. We like a little more flavor. We my theory is if you're used to a very neutral and yeah. you want to do a lot of large breasts and barbecue mm -hmm. or, or like you know grilled chicken uh, and it's a neutral slate, Cornish is probably going to do that for you. Yeah. If you're looking for a little more meaty. Uh, then <laughs> some of the others may have a little richer, meaty flavor to them. Yeah. So, yeah. I like a little more flavor to mine. Ours, mind. because we go 16 to 20 weeks, a lot of them really are not, almost none of them are grillable. They're a little smaller. Uh, some of them are roastable, uh, and some of them have to be you know, boiled or braised. Do it work outside our homestead? Yes, there's a reason why we are called part-time permies. We do permaculture here, part-time. <laughs> um I am a genetic counselor, so I work at the cancer center downtown, um, and <coughs> you have your own business. Yeah, for the last uh, year Which and a half, approaching two years, I have been running a pasta, awesome. a specialty pasta business. It's a wholesale retail. Uh, and we however, have a link in yeah. the description below if you like pasta. However, mm -hmm. I while I do that full time, uh, I do have a commercial uh, manufacturing kitchen yeah. on our property. Yep. Uh, at the moment. So I am here a lot more than I would be otherwise. However, I, um, uh, I'm on, you know, I'm on the road doing farmer's markets and delivering to restaurants and handling business. So yeah, but we're both full-time employed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> God, credit for handling <laughs> snakes. Wow. Okay. I used to just catch them in my backyard as a kid. So my mom taught biology at a college, uh, and she took one of the snakes. I well, she took one of the snakes I caught and put it in a garbage can, but let let the lid be part of the way open because she was afraid of suffocating it, yeah, and yeah. it was gone by morning. It, it was about a three foot long garter don't, snake. Don't leave a lid part way open on a snake. <laughs> it was just a garter snake. Yeah. Uh, so. we've been seeing a lot of turtles over the last couple yes. of weeks. Actually, I'll put it in the next video, but I'll give you guys a heads up. Um, we'll have a couple videos coming out soon. Uh, one is on the garden update on what we're doing, mainly from stuff today. <laughs> and this morning, I was chopping and dropping some of the grasses that are encroaching in the garden. And I found a eastern box turtle. Felt that big. This is the second one because we found yeah. one in a backwoods area which was about that big. It was a nice medium sized one. This one was smaller. And then I was driving back on Thursday, I huh. think. And I'm going down, there's a woodsy area, the woods on both sides, about eh, most of a mile down Thanks, the road. Tina. And we're on a bit, pretty busy country road um, and paved road. And I thought there was some branches or debris in the road. And I was just coming up to it uh, fast and was moving out of the way. And I saw a head sticking. I'm like, those aren't, clump of leaves that's, that's a turtle that's a turtle i hope he moved i probably should have just stopped and moved him over but um hopefully but he didn't get hit i you know what i went to market i didn't see any help i think i would have seen a mashed mark yeah. so uh I, and it was a, again it was a, a medium you know yeah. it was a nice size turtle but it was totally on the shell and the head was up it wasn't <laughs> resting it was moving yeah so yeah i mean i have the actually the one we saw in the woods and when we're hiking our trails that was the first box turtle I had ever seen. Usually I see painted turtles, at least at my parents' place. We used to have those. Um, or some you know, various water turtles, like snapping turtles and stuff. But uh, And we had a snapping turtle a few years ago in our front yard. We had a big snapping turtle. I mean, turtle. it was, they get was big, bigger than that. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. So it had somehow crawled. There is a drainage creek, but... Not extremely close. It's 200 yards or more away. 
to the next road. Yeah. Um, or it crawled out. I don't know where it came from. It was it yeah. was way out of its way, and it was all the way up to almost our front door across our driveway. And I'm like, check this out. And by and it turned around and started walking back into the woods. Now the woods next to us is a fairly deep and a little bit moister woods, so it would probably do fine there. But I don't know what it was doing there. It was. We were really surprised to find out. I mean, a good-sized turtle. Yeah, yeah. So, but this one in the garden was small, but I don't too big to get out because we have like two by two inch by four inch uh, welded wire um, fencing around the entire garden. So it must have found a little gap or something, gotten in. But so I had to take it out um, and put it in the woods so it could go do its thing. But yeah, <clears throat> so that was fun today. Um, okay. Blue, see a blue race around there, but haven't seen one in years. We saw Garden. a pretty good sized snake. We were walking around a, there's a water reservoir pumping area close to yeah. us. And, and we were hiking in there and we ran across a pretty big. We get a lot of snake. hog Well, you took a picture. Here. We were trying to figure out yeah. what it was. If it I was never a did hog look nose it or yeah. it had a little different pattern and we were but hog noses are so variable that's the it was problem. good size it's probably five or six feet yeah it was, uh, it was i just was looking still. for forage stuff and i looked down about two feet and i did not uh it was the beginning of morels and other things and um, i didn't see any mushrooms i'm like hey that's a snake yeah um so i am just actually opening up. Well, I'll do this a different way. Um, we we did do a forged feature this week, too, if you guys want to take a look at that. Basically, um, we didn't have to go very far for it. No, we didn't. It just kind of showed up in our front yard. I think we've seen them before, but we yeah. never really pursued exactly what they were. Yeah, so how many of you guys know what this is? For those of you guys who follow it's us. It's a mushroom. Yes, what type? Um <laughs> For those of you guys who follow us, we had to look it up. On no, I mean we kind of knew what it was. I mean it makes sense. But um, it took us a little bit of verification just to make sure. And then we and we thought most of the stuff we get in that front section that's just a mowed area along the road. We don't deal with. We yeah are not usable. So yeah. Um, interestingly, this is an edible, and we did eat one of them. We got three. Um, Yes, and two were went too far. Yeah, they they mature really fast. I mean, they yeah. it, they were up and gone in two days on each of them. So anybody have a guess on what type of mushroom but this is? But we did get is? one of them and we ate it uh, last night. Yeah. It was, it was we pretty, did try it. Was it was actually edible. pretty good. It's edible. Some people say it's so-so. I actually thought for its style and flavor, it was pretty good. Yes, you got it. Linda's on Linda's it. got it. Shaggy something. Shaggy mane. Yeah. Shaggy mane mushroom. So it's uh, actually, um, okay, sorry. Looks like sheep grazing. <laughs> it does kind of look like sheep. sheep. You know, uh, there's other names for it. Shaggy mane is the most common one you hear around here. Scientific name is Caprinus Um, But it also goes by lawyer's wig or judge's wig. So that's old fashioned um, when they used to wear wigs. So that mushroom is about, the head on it's about two to three inches tall. Yeah. We had one that was a little, was probably three to four inches tall, and it grew in about a day and a yeah. half, and then, and then it emerges with the stem, and the stem on one of them shot up about six inches overnight, yeah. but it completely spores and disintegrates uh, within hours so, of that time. So it's yeah. We picked one the day before that looked like that, and then we went and had it sit for twelve hours. And yeah, it, it was like almost, this. it was just a little more advanced. Yeah. And oh, we came back in the morning, the entire outer portion digests and you actually yeah. have the inner gills exposed. So it is a form of an inky cap mushroom, but very, um, very kind of unique in its look. And otherwise, at, at that point, in that condition, it's yeah. not really um, edible. Not desirable. And then actually that whole section disappears yeah. and you're left with a little cap at yeah. the top. So actually, when it's when it is di uh, digesting itself, which is what it's doing, was turning black mm -hmm. out in the field. If it's doing that out there, what it's actually doing is releasing the spores on the very edge of the cap first, and that part will turn black first. 
And then as that releases, it'll move up the cap yeah. and the cap will open and it'll, the, the, um, gills will just self digest and release the spore. It, so almost, it's looks like, it almost looks like melting rubber. You know, yeah, it does. It, so it gets this little flare to it with drips of ink. Yeah. And that was actually used for ink as well. You'd have to get a lot of them. You would have to get a lot of them, but they grow um, in Europe and in the U.S., so they're all over the place. They are edible when you get on the early. Yeah, you did see it on the Facebook page. Um, they are edible when you get them early, before they start turning so we did cook. We did cook it. We pulled one, and when, if you harvest them and you're certain of it, yeah. you need to cook them pretty fast, like Within hours. That, yeah, that day. Yeah. So I just cut them in four pieces, seared them with a little butter in a saute pan to check and see what the flavor was like. Um, they're fairly medium to mild uh, in texture. Uh, the stem's a little stringy, but not bad, and it breaks down with heat. Yeah. And I thought with it lightly seared, it tastes a lot like, like a king oyster or even like a blue foot. Now, blue foot and some of those have tend to be a little bitter. It can be quite bitter sometimes. Mm -hmm. I felt like this wasn't as structurally strong as either one of those, uh, the king oyster, the blue foot, or as bitter as the blue foot. But it, it had just a hint, a very little hint of bitterness on the end. And I found it actually uh, for a, a mild flavored mushroom to be <laughs> quite tasty. Hi, white pick fence. So we're just talking about um, the featured forage item this week, which we tried for the first time was the shaggy mean mushroom. Now I would not advise trying mushrooms without verifying first. So we, we kind of knew what we had. We verified it. Um, and we were a hundred percent certain of yeah. what it was. And we also know that there is no lookalikes on this. No. It grew under all the right conditions and it had all, the, and we also had it through all the phases. Yes. That's why we ate the third one. Yes. The only one left because we were kind of we looking at it, it and playing and we just thought it was a toadstool mushroom <laughs> at first, you know, some whatever, well, just unknown. And as we started digging into it, we realized we were a hundred percent on identification and it yeah. was edible and there wasn't a look alike and so therefore no it was i mean trying. there is a look kind of similar but it's really not um and, but the problem is it is a deadly one one some of the amanita mushrooms which some of them are hallucinogenic and some of them are just deadly do have scales on them and do start as like an egg shape mm -hmm. down close to the ground with those scales on them but the thing is this will shoot up on the stalk and have that long um almost like an elongated egg shape <clears throat> rather than amanitas will break off of that and then open up. These don't open up until they start deliquescing, which is the word for when it starts digesting itself and turning black. And my mom, when I looked at these, it look, it does look like a wig or it looks like a, a band major helmet, but it reminded me the dome shape of there's a famous old, Stone Water Tower in Ypsilanti, Michigan, oh. down by Eastern Michigan. It reminds yeah. me of that water tower shape. Yeah, it's uh, a odd. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting. It's a unique, you know, yeah, a unique shape, arch yeah. architectural water tower. Yeah. So it reminded me of that uh, in many ways. So, yeah. And these, by the way, they will grow anywhere from late spring, early summer through fall, um, but they do tend to pop up right after heavy rains. So that's probably why we had them popping up because we've had so much yeah. rain and they will come back in the same locations here. And we, I think we've seen them there before. Yeah. Uh, as far as canning mushrooms, yeah, you can can mushrooms. Obviously you can buy them. Usually you can them in a, in a heavy brine to flavor them. Unless you have very strong, sturdy mushrooms, they're more fibrous ones. They don't yeah. can well. So there's only a limited number. And I, I find that it changes the flavor and texture a lot um sometimes some pretty, like ne pretty negatively some, some, of them like are, some of them are okay um i think another option is you can pickle them mm. pickle them in a fairly strong vinegar like a 50 percent cider vinegar or wine vinegar 50 percent water with a pretty good salinity and so the high acidity and the high um, salt not only is it preservative and for safety um it helps to firm and, and prevent uh, vegetables and, and mushrooms from uh, getting soft. And so if you like pickled things, uh, pickling some of your common mushrooms, uh, like white mushrooms or oyster mushrooms, is another alternative. And they'll 
keep a little more of their natural flavor and a little more of their texture, their you know the stronger texture. Uh, however, they're going to taste vinegary, and and you can also uh, and I just a lot of times pour a hot brine, a boiling hot brine over them and just let it sit and then chill it. Uh, and you can also add in nice herbs. It's like Michigan Mike spices. knows who... Okay, yeah, well, there are a number of people from, from Michigan, yeah. from the east side that, um, yeah, that yeah, I'm no, not what, surprised. Yeah. So it's a very... Anybody who's been through there, it's, it, any, it's you know, common... Historic you know, water know. tower, yeah. So, so um, the only other mushroom I found that someone was... Uh, asking about um, it looked a little different too it's another inky cap but it grows on wood this one grows on the lawn the one that grows on the wood I don't think it's not edible it's just not desirable we had some inky crabs caps growing on our locust stump uh, a week ago yeah we did but and into the lawn a little bit yeah but those were the little button type one so I don't trust my identification of those at, at this point. She canned already canned ones. Oh, well, there you go. That's a, that's a new one. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Huh. That's interesting. Favorite use for strawberries. Favorite. Oh. Um. I'll I'll give you a little secret. I like strawberries, but they are not my favorite berry because they're not highly acidic. I, I like for as I a like chef, that. I find them. They're somewhat muted because of the lower acidity. Uh, I don't dislike them, but I like raspberries and, and blackberries and such better. Um, yeah, we make some jam. We do regular jam, strawberry jam, strawberry rhubarb jam. I actually put uh, some fresh lemon juice in to brighten it up the flavor and to increase the acidity. Mm. And so it, it's tartar because you already have all the sugar that you're adding. That actually makes a really, really nice strawberry jam. Um, I put them on ice cream on cereal on, yeah, I mean, or just snack them. Fresh is, snack on them. <laughs> yeah. We have small, we should have them pretty soon in a week We have or a two. bunch of green uh, strawberries. That, Wild transplant yep. strawberries. Yep. So uh, They're pretty good. I have a few left from last year. We didn't get a lot uh, put away in the freezer, so I need to, uh, um, so I need to make some jam. We actually have some other berries. I may do a mixed. And then right now I have five bunches of rhubarb that I need to, um, process one i've had for almost a week already i need to do something with do them. something with them you had an idea for a meal with those right well i i think that uh rhubarb works nice with pork uh, like pork chops and pork roast pork loin mm -hmm. um, you, because it's sour it's you can use it so get actually we pickled rhubarb last year the year before i did a demo of pickling yeah. rhubarb that was very tasty uh i'm not sure if i had the exact recipe but I used a cider vinegar and, I don't know, red wine. I think I put some red wine in with a red wine vinegar. Hmm. And it's a sweet and sour. And I had some cloves. And, and anyways, it made a really good pickle. Uh, but, yeah, you can make uh, rhubarb into, like, a chutney or a sweet, sweet and sour uh, sauce uh, or, you know, chunky sauce um, that could garnish um pork chops and then you could add in some other fruit like strawberries or cranberries or whatever uh, and that that's pretty nice with with meat like that and it would work with chicken too i think carrie said her favorite use for strawberries is eating, eating them. that was what i was going to say was, <laughs> well, eating them, of course straight out of our and well and it also depends on the type of strawberry i like strawberry ice cream i also like the wild ones much better than most cultivated varieties because i think even though they're smaller the wild ones are tarter they have yeah. a stronger flavor to them. So there is a, if you're looking for a really amazing strawberry, Cornell has a strawberry that you can get. It's grown in the Hudson Valley of New York. So north of New York City where it is, it is cooler and wetter uh, in the forest areas in there. They developed a strawberry. Uh, it was supposed to be the perfect strawberry. Super good, intense flavor. It's a small to medium size, I would say, pretty much a small berry. Um, and they did that. It's very, very good. But commercially, nobody wanted it because it was too small. Because you notice mm -hmm. some of the California ones and Florida ones are like this. Uh, but sometimes they don't taste like much because the you're spreading that concentration of flavor. So if you're looking for a really good canning or pie berry. Um, Do you remember what the variety is you called? You can look it up. It, it is available for sale. Uh, and you need to be in the right climate because i know we were in westchester mm -hmm. it didn't grow well there you needed to be about 45 minutes north and there were a few producers bringing them into the city we have you know the wild transplant and oh in michigan we do a lot of strawberries in this area 
uh, in parts, but the strawberries that are grown, because we're prone to a lot of uh, cool mornings and dew and mold potential, mm -hmm. uh, our harvest can be a week, it can be three weeks, it's a, you know, rarely is it much over a month. Uh, it's really fast. Uh, so I think that, um, um, so what it is, is we don't export our berries and they're also picked much riper than California or Florida, um, Texas, et cetera. So they're only good for a day, three days, four days, and they don't transport well, mm -hmm. uh, which means we have really good berries if you go to the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. If you're making pies and jams and, and whatever, or just eating them fruit salads, they're super good and, and we're spoiled with how good they are, but they don't leave the state. Uh, so they've lost a lot of their commercial value. Mm -hmm. uh, we also did a lot of, um, there were, there is a lot of jam packing uh, still in the area. So your mom said, had a suggestion. Yeah, I, I like that too. I like it with the cream cheese, the biscuit, biscuit crust. I'm okay with it, but yeah, I don't mind a, a short crust. Um, I do like the, che the cream cheese uh, layer and that also keeps the crust from um, getting soggy. So mm -hmm. Maybe my mom wants to explain it, but um, yeah. So if you um, like strawberry pie, but feel like it always goes, especially if you're using a Bisquick or a biscuit crust, it goes soft on you. The the answer is the cream cheese. On the lower layer. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, rhubarb likes a decent amount of water. Uh, it likes cooler climates, best I know. I think you would be out of luck growing rhubarb considering everything you tell us about your land. Um, it is it a is spring item that grows. You can only harvest it until it gets hot. So that's going to be through June, pretty much. Uh, basically, here. it overlaps the strawberry season. It comes a little before and then overlaps into it, making the strawberry rhubarb the perfect sweet, sweet and sour combination. Uh, so the leaves, you cut the leaves off. They're um, slightly poisonous. You eat the stalks. Um, and as it matures into the heat, they become no longer edible okay. or usable. So, uh, and they, and rhubarb grows all the way across the state here very, very well. I think it likes relatively sandy drained soils, but it does like, um, it does like its water. It does yeah. like some nutrients and, um, I mean, they grow really big around here, except for in our yard. They, we put some in a year ago and, somebody and they're keeps just eating them. barely hanging in there. Yeah. I don't know what they should be just. Grow. I mean, you can get rhubarb in this area that are, Huge. you know, they're this big. And of course, the stalks ideally should be almost three feet long after you take the leaf off. Yeah. And the leaf can be, you know, this huge green leaf, which you throw away. So. Um, wait a minute. Was that talk about salty salad? <laughs> Pretzels and jello. <laughs> what is salty salad? Okay. Yeah, I didn't say that. Um, we were talking about. Yeah, jello Jell combination. Flat, like a couple weeks Salty ago. Salty salad, wow. I don't know. That was a guess by Green Raven. 13 Moons will have to explain that one. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, no, I mean, I am excited because once our strawberries start, our strawberries start, and as soon as they're wrapping up, our ras wild raspberries are going, and as soon as they're wrapping up, we get the dewberries going, so we're about to start our I'm not making time. any strawberry the jam time. this year because I made a bunch last year and the year before. I actually have cherries from last year's harvest uh, from the neighbor's orchard. Said yes, road. pretzels and jello. Really? Oh, boy. <laughs> so I still have uh, yeah cherries in the freezer, tart cherries in the yeah. freezer. I have a whole bunch of brandied cherries that I made last year. We've hardly, I don't think we've hardly broken into those. Maybe one of them? Hmm. We're kind of forgetting they're down there. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I won't be – so I'm going to try and get that that jam made of the um, cherry jam. And I'll probably do our mixed berries that have been laying around in the freezer, maybe a little bit of our wild strawberries. But I don't need strawberry jam right now. I'm a little low on blackberry, newberry jam. I am out of cherry jam. Pretzel butter crust with strawberry jello and really? Cool Whip. No, it's huh. sweet and salty. How does it become a salad, though? That's the question. Because everything Jello is it's a salad. salad yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, um, yes, with some cream cheese. Okay. 
Anyway, we're still talking about strawberries and cream cheese and different things well, to do so, with Yeah, so uh, planting food crops that can be neglected. That is permaculture. Yes, that is. That are minim minimally adjusted or harvested, um, but m not taking regular yes. care. We were actually... I so was, perennial items. Yeah, so that's kind of what our food forest thing is going to happen up front. H it's, how about agave? That's a good cash crop. Agave. I, I, I like your, um, I like the cassava that you put in, or that's, right? Who was that? Wasn't she doing the cassava? Who are we talking about? Oh, Carrie. Oh. She, she says wants to plant food crops that are she, neglected. Oh. So cassava, she I think. She was doing yucca. Well, that's the same thing. Okay. Um, yeah, so I like that because that's definitely suited for the climate. Yeah. And it has, basically doesn't have any predators, yeah. so. Um. Cherry trees are going growing cherries, yay! Ours are growing leaves. We put in two <laughs> two small cherries this year. We're not yeah. going to see cherries no. probably for at least two or three years, and our, then it's going to be very limited. Our nanking bushes are also leafing out, so that's yeah. good. So they we'll look see healthy. cherries on. We might see cherries on that in a year. In or two. a year or so. Um, yeah. So Tina's off to bed. Okay, night, Tina. Yeah, it is. It's 9.45. So any other questions for Ask the Chef? I didn't really officially go into that, but it kind of turned into that from the mushroom talks. So um, we have strawberry talks. What else do people have? Yeah, strawberries coming? should hit the market. I'm hoping if we were a little less rain projected this week. Uh, so we might see local strawberries Only next week. Only two days projected. Which is fine. Strawberries need rain. They just don't need constant rain. No. Uh, we Because of the mold situation, if the exactly. rain we've been getting... Even if the strawberries show up, they're going to ruin the crop uh, almost, you know, almost immediately. So, yeah. so I thought we had just one tree oh, on the, the property trees? and found a bunch more. Oh, that's wow, that's nice. What kind my, of cherries are they? My grandparents had two cherry trees on their little property. They loved, had produced for years, but then uh, I think they In got New old. York, the Italian crew that I worked with all Italians always wanted white cherries huh. which of course you can get from I mean it's a sweet cherry but it's it's pale uh, so and pay a lot more I like the dark sweet cherries a lot uh, for desserts and such but then of course just the standard tart cherry for pies and jams and things so what else do people have that is just coming into harvest time we have mosquitoes har uh, oh, came into God. harvest this last week that Oh my god. Came in yeah. like a swarm. They are terrible all of a sudden. Le all of a sudden, like last weekend was the first weekend and they were definitely all over but the, the place. But the dragonflies have slowly started to show up. Yes. A couple of years ago, we had swarms of dragonflies, which is fine. And yeah. they were eating all the mosquitoes. So I'm anticipating uh, swarms of them uh, being very active. Yeah. So. We also have our peach and nectarine trees are leafing out nicely. They had flowers on them. Yeah, the yellow red cherries. Those, those are the white, the down color, white cherries, the rainier yeah. white cherries. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, were they developed out in Washington? Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. Well, at least, the at least the variety. I don't know if the yeah. only place to have them. No, but the but mountains that, right there. Yeah. 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 Rain. Oh, uh, yeah. Mount Rainier. Oh, hey, guys. Yes, we are coming to the end. We're just asking for more chef questions or cooking questions. So we talked about chickens. We talked about mushrooms. We talked about vegetables. Yeah. We talked about yucca. <laughs> yeah, yucca. That's, I like yucca a lot. You can do a lot with it. Yeah. Um, she was feeding the stalks to her rabbits. Well, isn't the stalks, is, isn't that callaloo? Am I mistaken? But no, taro. It's taro root, which is I don't know. You'll have to watch her video because you haven't watched. I it. know you mentioned it. I haven't gone back to watch yeah. it. Uh, any tips for pickling onions? Can I get them to taste like store bought? Um. Well, that may be good or bad. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm not actually a lot of the store bought canned products. You can commercially can most things as well commercially as you do at home. So it's that's a good thing to buy because they're so inexpensive and easy. Um, yeah, they're going to use a white vinegar probably. So don't get anything fancy. You could do white wine vinegar. So white vinegar. Um, there's a I like if you look up Thomas Keller, the chef from 
um, the French Laundry and, and other places, there is something called Thomas Keller's Standard or Basic Pickling Brine. Um, I like to work off of that one as a base. Uh, it just works very, very well for many things. It's a good neutral. You can change up the vinegars, but you pretty much keep the proportions roughly the same. Check the acidity on your vinegars. Not all vinegars have the same acidity. Um, keep the salt somewhat constant, but that can go up and down a little bit. Uh, a lot of times it has, so it can be one to one. Uh, a good a good brine would be one part white vinegar, one part water, and it could go as much as two parts water. Uh, the more vinegar you do, the um, and it's sharper in flavor, but it's also going to hold the firmness. Mm -hmm. um, you can also do you can just put cold vinegar in. You can boil it in hot vinegar, you know, in the brine. Or what many things I do to keep the crunch is I take a boiling hot brine, dump it into the canister packed with the item, let it sit on the counter for a couple of minutes, and so it kind of cooks, pseudo sterilizes. And begins to penetrate into the vegetable, uh, and then uh, and I cap it, and then I put it in the fridge, and it cools down. It's usually ready in a couple days. Um, some you know, sometimes next day. That works great for carrots, medium-sized slices, and such. Um, on top of that, you can add in sweetening ingredients, um, sugar, honey, whatever. That has a lot of flexibility. You can do a small amount just to cut the vinegar, you know, the burn on the vinegar mm -hmm. uh, and the saltiness, or you can go up to massive amounts of sugar so it becomes a very sweet, um, sweet, sour, and then spices are totally up to you. Obviously, pickling spices, peppercorn, things like that, bay leaf, thyme are, are kind of standard, but you can be really inventive. Uh, even putting a cinnamon stick is a really nice thing to put a, just a tiny amount of a portion of a cinnamon stick in or one clove or a piece of star in it. You can start going into Asian and African and put a chili pepper in there. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Onions do pickle very well. Uh, I like the hot brine thrown over the top to keep the crunch. And and the last, you know, that's a refrigerated pickling. So it will last in under refrigeration for a long time. We used to do buckets of white mushrooms, pearl onions. Um, you did green strawberries. We did green strawberries. We would take the crudite off of party platters, you know, when it's out for like a half hour and nobody touches it. We would take all the cauliflower and carrots and sometimes even the celery and whatever. We'd either make our brine with that or we would sometimes actually brine buckets of that and then put it out as a pickled, as a pickled vegetable mm -hmm. uh, on things. I worked with uh, a number of cooks from the Caribbean, uh, seem to have a touch for pickling and seasoning and flavoring using things like a... You know, putting in a little cinnamon, a little allspice, and just having that perfect knack of sweet and sour and spiced. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think those things and using that basic brine. There's another book called Ratios, uh, which was put together with Thomas Keller, and or Michael Rollman did it, but he worked a lot as a writer that did a lot with famous chefs. He wrote a book called Ratios on how to make things and convert things from one thing to another. And so uh, I believe Ratios has some brining. Mm. Um, yeah. So. That's cool. And what tomatoes? You can go straight, is... you can go straight uh, vinegar, uh, no sugar, uh, either for health or flavor. But I think I like a little sugar to take just, even if you don't taste the sweetness, just take the burn off. And that could even be a, just yeah. a, a teaspoon or two of honey sometimes. Um, what is your favorite way to fix tomatoes and eat them? I like to eat my black cherry tomatoes straight off the Yeah, bottom. I think if they're good tomatoes, just eating them uh, at room temperature, fresh, right out of the garden while they still taste like the vine is probably the best way. BLTs yeah. for your beef steaks. But they're good grilled, um, good pickled, especially when they're firmer and underripe uh, or fried. I don't do a or lot green. Of, yeah, I don't do a lot of fried tomatoes, but when they're done properly, they're really good. And, of course, making lots of sauce. You can do a fresh chop sauce where it's a quick cook and they're ready in a few minutes. Or you can obviously make a traditional cook down marinara sauce. So. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, no, there's a lot of things to do with tomatoes, too. Yeah, I'm a fan of tomatoes in almost any condition. Um, Did you know that that is the most uh, grown garden vegetable? Not surprised yeah. at all. That's in America. That's what everybody goes to the market for. Yeah. So, and if you have a garden, that's whatever. People are buying grows. tomatoes at the farmer's market already. People you are. You know what's funny? Hoop housing them and yes. doing all kinds of 
whatever, however they get the tomatoes just so they can say they've got a few. You know what's funny is I have a sister who doesn't like tomatoes, but when she grew vegetables, she always grew tomatoes because she had a knack for growing tomatoes. She just liked to grow them, but she didn't like to eat them, hmm. except in salsa. Salsa is good. Too. Yeah, salsa is a good. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with the good tomato in almost any way. Yeah, yeah. Tomatoes so are just... slicer. Tomatoes do not make particularly good sauce. I'll mm, tell you that they're too yeah. wet. They don't have really intense flavor. So that's where you want your paste tomatoes and your Roma style tomatoes. Those are yeah. Those we're doing two uh, Roma style tomatoes uh, this year, and I think I planted four of each of them right now. So, yeah, I keep I we more. keep trying to convert over some you know because when you get slicers or cherries or grape tomatoes or whatever. You get such an abundance, you can hardly eat them all. And I keep reminding Sunny, don't forget to plant lots of paste tomatoes because those are usable all year long. So those I might, uh, basically, if we have some extra room that we see in the garden, I might take our extras because I have a ton of extra tomatoes that we can plant as well. I, again, I seem to, I couldn't start them from seed for a long time. I would always lose the seedlings. But the soil blocks, I've been able to start those things and grow those things like crazy easily. Um, there is something about not getting root about root bound by any plastic. Well, they're, that wa helps. they're water sensitive. They're a yeah. little bit heat sensitive. They're they're a difficult crop. You didn't show the last picture, the locust flowers. Oh no, I haven't showed the locust flowers. We haven't. So talked we're about we're locusts. on the. We only yeah. get a few days of locust flowers. These are and locust we're flowers. in a real heavy bloom this year. Uh, they go up and down. We get them every year, but this year they're real heavy because of the water. Yeah. So these are our black locust trees, which we have an overabundance of. We don't especially like them, but they have they're these. They're useful. We just have a lot of them. Yeah. A few too many. There's too many of them. They shade out too many things in our yard. But um, they are in flower right now, and this flower is edible. So I grabbed a handful. They're pretty perfumey, too. Yeah, they are. Actually, we're slightly out. Uh, Allergies going around. I think that's one of the things that's. But yeah, I grabbed a handful. A lot of them were really high up, but there's we found a few that were low down. Grabbed a handful, and they're pretty tasty. Uh, they're a little bit sweet. I think they taste a little bit like corn. Yes. Or corn, so, you know, like uh, corn silk or corn broth, sort of like that. Yeah. So yeah, they're tasty, so, but they'll only be around mild. for a few days. I mean, they're they're blowing off in the wind and the rain, and yeah, they're, all they're our gone storms. real quick. Yep. And we don't have that many that are actually within reach either because our trees are so tall. Uh, that is another thing you could do with locust trees, though. You can coppice them, so you could cut them down to like three feet or four feet or something, and they will grow new sprouts up, new branches out, and it'll be more like bush-like. So if you like the flowers and you want to harvest them, I would coppice the tree so you could actually reach the flowers because these trees are like, how tall do you think those trees out front are? They're huge. Oh, they're over 50 feet. Yeah. And my guess is uh, they're under 40 years old. Um, they're 30 to 40 years old. They just grow really fast. Okay. Uh, but they're, they, you know, they're, they're dirty trees uh, because they're unstable and they break. So a lot of branches break off through the year. Yeah. So they, they, they and they're drop, thorny. And they're thorny. Uh, and some they tend are. to, they tend to not only have some weak limbs, but they tend to it, have a brittle. long trunk that's brittle, and sometimes they rot. Ours, they tend to rot in the middle, so they they don't last that long. They do like to they fall don't over. rot. They're locust trees. They well, they come up to the, the middle gets not damaged. very often in locust. They're the problem is we're in sand and they're yeah. tilting. Our winds are actually blowing them over. So I don't think the sands. I don't know how the root structure is. Well, but I've never yeah. seen them rotted. Um, well, some of them have their their crevices in them where they they're unstable but yeah they don't they don't last long and their ours are very tall <clears throat> i want to cut down a whole bunch of them i haven't had a lot of time i've been trying to do that for almost three years uh some of them are so big we can't take down in one piece they're going to yeah. fall on other trees or on wires or wires or, or so we need yeah. we're going to need to get somebody in to at least top them and bring bring them down even if we do the rest of the work yeah so white picket fence is growing pink ox hearts this year for slicing tomatoes. Yeah, I haven't heard of those, but I mean there are so many tomatoes and yeah, so many so many ones. types. We have charger. We're growing charger for I believe a slicer, and we do have some striped German as well. There's so many different flavors you can yeah. get out of tomatoes too. Yes, yes. 
My favorite cherries are the black cherries. Um, I do like doing just a basic sliced salad of mixed heirloom tomatoes, and you can compare, you know, very sweet to kind of funky, to more sour, and just having a, a salad with a good olive oil on it, maybe a little vinegar on it, and yeah, that works nice. No, we have not ever grown duckweed. Um, Carrie's trying to grow it in a tank for her ducks and geese who don't like it. Huh. That's kind of funny. Well, if they did like it, they'd eat it so fast you'd never be able to keep up. Yeah. Um, our geese are definitely our lawn mowers out here. So uh, part of our no mowing our back process is because we have the geese. Um, yeah, they really... So the chickens really like bugs and grain. And, by 13 minutes. You know, and things. Whereas the the geese really like grasses. Yes, they do. They'll eat they grain. Like grains. They eat a little bit of bugs, but um, I haven't but, really noticed them going for bugs. But I, they don't dig for the bugs the no. way, yeah. And they, they don't but scratch. they really like the grass, the greens. Almost, almost everything other than our plantain. Yeah, they don't eat the plantain. Our, our, our lawn plantain. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they eat. They don't like the rye grass that's in seed right now. They'll eat rye grass, you know, like yeah. perennial rye grass. Um, they like but white. they prefer a lot of other things. Yeah. Um, white picket fence. They're new to her, uh, to them also. Got them two years ago from a place that had non-GMO seeds. Did not. Well, there are so many grow. variety. People are constantly crossing. They of course cross so easily. We did not buy any new seeds this year, uh, other than well, a few herbs, a few, herbs. Flowers, and a few, few herbs. herbs and flowers, but not any new vegetable seeds. So we're going on all old seeds. Which for our peppers, I was surprised that they did very well because usually they're not supposed to do well after the first year. Um, yeah, we just figured we'd catch up. We, you know, we always yeah. everybody ends up with extra seeds. We decided we'd try and make make it by, and it's, I think we've done fine. Good protein source for people too. The duckweed. Yeah. Huh. Um, yeah. I haven't had it. It's another name for that too. I don't know. Um. Yeah. So. But no, what else are people growing? And it, that's a big question. We have standard things. I still have to get. We're growing a lot of grass. <laughs> Turning the beds, we've got a, some of the beds were I turned and a, month, a, lot of grass. a month ago or more, and they, yeah. yeah and while they were, you know, they were broad forked. Yeah. Oh, by the way, so the broad fork made it through the three thousand square feet. I did bend a couple of times. Uh, we have some <laughs> some pine roots in one area. That I got into, and if you get the root on a bunch of times, you kind of realize that because you're pushing too hard. If you get a root on you one time, it. it's kind of you don't really notice. Yeah. Um, but the broad fork did pretty well. I'm not sure if I can. I was thinking about can I have them retempered? Um, mm -hmm. And we do have a, a specialty artisan metal smith in the area. I don't know the exact metal. I'm not sure. I also don't know if the melt the welds would melt out. Mm -hmm. On the tines, so, so a little bit softened, but overall, uh, it worked well. I did destroy one new pair of gloves, uh, ripped a hole near the thumb from from uh, the work on it. Oh no! But yeah, yeah. so we, we made it made it through broad forking, and it took a lot longer, mostly due to time and weather. We could have had it done much much faster. Hello, Adirondack Camping Adventures. Hmm. You're new to us, so welcome. Uh, Michigan Mike asks, do we? ever order food out at times or do we just cook at home we, yeah we do we do we eat everything um, <laughs> we our favorite place in town is yeah, non la Viet vietnamese so place vietnamese street food modern yeah um sort of modern take yeah they just happen to be one of the best places in the entire area and are close yeah uh, and, they're and they're just not, off 94 they're not real pricey so they're just off 94. Um, Anyone driving from Detroit to Chicago can stop there. We ordered a pizza a few weeks ago. Yeah, not that long. A week ago. A week ago. I occasionally, you know, I some occasionally buy something semi-prepared, like at Costco, but not a lot. Partially because I don't feel, since I know how to make a lot of things, I know where the value is. Yeah. And I don't feel the price to value is good on a lot of pre-made items. Um, yeah, it depends on how busy we are. Uh, because I'm home more now, I do cook more. But a lot of times I'm, you know, I'm busy and have to, you know, I don't have a lot of time to do it. So, yeah. So white picket fence, learning a lot about companion planting. Um, get the book 
if you don't already have it, on uh, Jevons. What's his first name? John Jevons? The book on how to grow more. Oh, yeah. How to grow more I vegetables. I had multiple authors, but. No. Yeah. Um, how to grow more vegetables in less space than you ever thought possible. Yeah, they have a big companion section they have in the back. A huge companion section. And then not just that, they have a se section right after that lists a bunch of herbs and what they're good at deterring as far as pests and things. Um, Cornell and, is another yeah. good one. I don't know right off hand. So you have all the egg schools, egg universities are very good overall, but they also are expert in certain areas over mm -hmm. time. So like Nebraska is one of the best on meat science and Wisconsin, Michigan State is a good program, but Cornell did lots of plant breeding over many years and a lot on micronutrients. They had a, a professor that's been you know passed away quite a while ago, but he was known for like if you have hollow broccoli, you need like more boron. If you have holes in your potatoes, that brown spot on the potatoes, you need something else. And so some of it's companion planting, but he knew a lot about micronutrients mm -hmm. and pioneered that. So you can do a lot on companion planting and micronutrients if you poke around Cornell. Um, I'll look up the author here for you real quick. I'll look up the book, but actually. Yeah, with, now with internet, things that were kind of hard to get a hold of, they're more professional. You had to be find the right sources to get the book. Now they're pretty accessible with searches. So you can find lots of stuff on companion planting. Uh, lots of things on soil amendments, on you know creating the right soil using natural plants, on adding in um, you know what things grow well together, what things add in a certain mineral or nutrient so that you can grow something the next rotation, or rotational crops where you can grow three or four different things over a period of years, so you can go back and grow a key item that that you're looking to grow like wheat with organic wheat, which is very intensive. So I'm just trying to see if I have it in one of my kits first. I think you did. I think, there we go, gardening books. Um, it's got to be in the gardening books. Yes. There are probably, if, yeah, this is the most recent edition. I think we have. Um, There's been quite a few. Yeah, there have been. Um, and they're like 30 years right. in since the book, at least since the book so was published. So let me get the. But they keep updating link. it. It is. They do. It John is Jevons, John Jevons or Je Jevons, Jevons. Yeah. So I think um, they were 60s or 70s, I want to say 70s in California desert trying to reclaim soil. was how, And they were able to do that in about yeah. three years, I think. So he's expanded a lot of it to uh, also with less water than you thought possible on that too. So Carrie should probably be interested in that too. Yeah, they were taking um, desert that was people determined to be unusable and showing that you could grow you know, vegetable crop, grain crop, sustainability. And some of that, I think they were not only trying to grow for the U.S., they were looking at third world and distressed areas and how could you create living crops uh, for small families or communities that needed to support themselves in using new and old yeah. techniques uh, or, you know, teaching people to, to effectively and efficiently grow. So the white picket fence, the link that I had posted that's to the kit, that will take you to the most recent edition of that book. We have the seventh edition. That is the ninth edition. Okay. I use that book every year to determine what I'm growing together and such. So that is very helpful. Um, yeah, the Elliot Coleman stuff is really good, okay. but uh, you know, but this book is probably our go-to. Yeah. Um, well, between the two of them, yeah, right? and, Go and back that and forth. we yeah. got those. We were lucky enough. We got those very early on when we were starting our gardens. Yep. And they still continue, the, being probably our first two serious gardening books, they continue to be our most used. Yeah, they are definitely. So um, so I do bring it up. They we, don't talk about permacultures, but they're, no. and perennial use is, well, they're not as heavy on perennial use, no. but otherwise, because they do talk about French intensive and growing under glass domes or growing in yeah. high high density. So they touch almost every other topic other than perennial growing. Yeah, so they're not permaculture so much. They're more French intensive types of ideas, but you can apply it but to they a lot cro of things. But they cross over yeah. when you, you know, permaculture uses their methods. You, and, you already put it in your cart. Yeah, <laughs> it's, well, it's what, 19 bucks or something. I don't know. It is. Uh, 
It is well no, worth the money of all the 25 things. Twenty five, maybe I don't know. That, yeah, it's like gone up since we bought yeah. it. All the thing, and it's, we had a paperback, and it's paperback. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's a, of all the things we throw money at, that is that is a probably one of the most usable yeah. yep. few dollars that was spent. We, it goes out in the garden with me. That's how much I use it. I took it out to the garden today. We've done that many times. Yeah. So that I can remember what I'm planting with. Well, what. they have plot. They have all kinds yeah, of do. general information. They have plots. The other thing is you can get seeds. Uh, I know we have the one seed book that you recommend for when to plant things. and they have, But uh, you can get downloadable, at least a few years ago, like Excel spreadsheets from Johnny Seeds for free mm -hmm. where you can plug in your dates. Oh, it's 15 bucks. It's yeah, I say it's not greatly expensive. No. Uh, again, he's sold it many, many times. It's a resource. It's paperback. Yeah. There were a bunch of hippies growing in the desert. It's, you know, it's... Yeah. So there's a whole conversation on the duckweed going on. <laughs> That's funny. Um, we don't have any pond or anything. We'd like here. to dig a pond, but I mean, that's going to. We'll have to figure out a way to control the mosquitoes with that, too. Yeah, so well, that's the other issue. So you, need to have, there. you have to keep yeah. it fresh. I mean, that's a long ways out. And we have a friend who was looking at doing it. I said, well, don't you need a permit? Of course, we have a back area where. Years ago, you would just do it because yeah. it's small. Now with satellite, there's there's no way you know you you need to watch your you gotta permits. Be careful. And that's DNR and other things. But our friend was like, "Oh, we're gonna do it." And he says, "I talked with the DNR, and my footprint was small enough that there is a there enough. he there is a uh, there is a, a square feet or whatever um, that does not require any permit for." And then of course you can look at your 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 um, edges and your transfer space Ooh. and what's growing there as wetlands and, and that can actually be yeah um, not Protected. included yeah not included so <laughs> you get your you get your um 500 year flood zone which we would be at this year yeah yeah we're pretty much we're we're i think above the 100 year flood and we're approaching if if you you know like they build interstates and other things to a 500 year expected flood zone above it we're and they're probably flooding. approaching yeah we're approaching our 500 year flood yeah but crazy. yeah we'd like to put a pond because that's the one architectural thing we're missing um probably before that we'll do bees and we may put a couple of hogs that on the back. keeps mosquitoes but both both hogs and bees take more planning more yes. time and of course they take an upfront investment um to do both of those so yeah those would both likely come before any aquatic activity yes um so on the wish list but and i don't think we'll have any cows ever so. no we don't have the or right property for that probably not sheep or goats maybe but probably not but I, we could see you doing a six month or you know six month hogs like two of them yep. which is what we're allowed to do uh on an electric on an electric Alligator fence in turtles. our backwoods Really? I've never... I've, oh, I've heard of yeah, I've seen pictures seen, of those. Okay. Eight, every fish would put they're it in. They're wow. really aggressive. Okay. Oh, no. I don't think we have those up here uh, or around here. No, no. We, we have don't. snappers, but we don't have... Yeah, alligator turtles are really aggressive. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. Um, yeah, you're regulated more... Get Michigan is definitely hole. regulated. We're not the Wild West, but it's a little, it's, it's moderate. Um, and it depends on the area a little bit, too. Your zoning um, and things, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd have to check into it, but that, that's what our friend who's pretty knowledgeable, when he checked with the DNR, they said that his footprint was too small. Uh, he didn't need a, didn't permits. need to have a permit or have a, a land study or anything. Yeah. Yeah, ninth edition is the newest edition right. of that book, so that is perfect. We have the. They're seventh. all like hand drawings in yeah. there. It's it's a pretty cool book. It is. It is. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, but it is. How did it get to be ten fifteen already? I know. Um, we should wrap this up because I'm exhausted from working all day. We in still the garden. gotta put baggies on our. Apple trees this week. Uh, yeah, we do. That's a whole nother thing. Save we have our apples. We have a video on that last year, but we gotta do that now. We have what? How many? Four hundred bags or two hundred bags? Uh, two hundred from this year and two hundred from last year. So there's probably a hundred left from last year. Yeah. Yeah. We salvage a lot of them, but 
Yeah, they're reusable. Yeah. Some of them got torn or flew away, but. <laughs> Some wind. But, um, yeah, we're in the north, too, but we're, in, you know, Michigan. So we're not east coast north, but we used to be east coast north. North, But, yeah, anyway, so we should wrap up. We definitely have a ton of projects still to do, including finishing the garden, putting the bags on the apples and everything. So you need, you need to fill the cracks in the driveway, too. That's, I didn't fill them last year. I was busy. So I need to fill the cracks. I don't know if I'll coat it, but at least we had a rough winter thing. and uh, definitely, definitely opened up some cracks. I need to do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys. I think we are going to end our live stream right now, but we will be back next week at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, same channel, of course. Uh, and we'll see what videos we get out this week. I didn't get anything out this week because I did the featured forged item. Oh yeah. But I will work on I have footage for two videos now. I'll work on at least getting one of them out this week. So we'll see you next week. Good night. Good night guys. <laughs>